Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. Hi, my name is Mike Perlman. Hi. Uh, teach at CSI, Combat Studies Institute, command staff college at Fort Leavenworth. Jeff Shadburn, Jerry Brown, and I are going to discuss some of the issues here to Lesson 11, the Pacific War. Um, hopefully you'll get some ideas that you can run with and probably do a better job than any of us ever do when we try to teach this course here which really wouldn't be a high standard at all. Anyway, I'm going to throw out some, some questions here to my alleged subject matter experts. Um, we've got here, for instance, you've, you've got these uh, three learning objectives. Analyze the major events in the Pacific War from 1943 to 1945. Let me, number one, say I think this is a misprint. Uh, the Pacific War for the United States, of course, goes from 1941 from Pearl Harbor to 45, and we're going to focus here on, on the war as a whole, just not the latter period, which is the period in which the United States goes on the strategic and operational offense. Anyway, um, on Pearl Harbor Day, or actually before Pearl Harbor Day, the United States has been in... United States Armed Forces has been in staff talks with the British, so at least we have a strategy uh, to be executed after Pearl Harbor Day. It's obviously a contingent strategy. It's to be executed if the United States becomes a belligerent. And essentially, well, subject matter experts, uh, what is the strategy for the Pacific theater in what is a global war? Uh, the first thing is is to make sure you focus on the the primary threat to the United States, which, which is, is perceived what? as Germany, which means against ja the Japanese Empire. Uh, you're going to have to have a strategic defensive action uh, to ensure that you don't siphon off strength that you're going to use against Germany. Now what is the war? Well, well, what's considered the worry in um, December 1941, if the United States goes on a two-ocean or two-continent offensive war in both directions at the same time. Uh, worst case, what's the response? Uh, I'm not sure what you're getting after that, but the worst case scenario is Britain's been knocked out of the war and it's the United Britain, States alone. Only Britain? 
Well, we've well, had another France, ally. That's right, France, France as well. Been out, France has already been knocked out, the Soviet Union. Uh, and the Soviet, Soviet Union, Union has not, not done very well in the first uh, six months of their war. Uh, exactly. Right. He's talking about the Soviet Union may not have entered the war at all, so it's a undivided Germany well, this is, that's conquered Great Britain, well, France. Well, this is December 1941. The Soviets are on the doors of Moscow. Moscow. They're on the doors of Leningrad. They've captured Kiev. They're moving in towards, well, not yet towards Stalingrad. They are hanging on by their fingernails. The worry is that if the United States does not reinforce Europe quickly, if it beats Japan, it will then have to turn around and beat Germany with who is allies. The United States is allies? Or yeah, well, who will be? If you want to take on the Germans one-on-one? -on -one? Absolutely. The United States, the worst case, absolutely no allies. So, your perfectly sensible solution to, is what? Is hang on to the continental United States while you build up your combat power to project it into Europe. And what does this mean for operations in the Pacific if for unforeseen circumstances we go to war with Japan. Wouldn't it be, by the way, better if we say did something which would deter Japan? I got a brilliant idea. I mean, I'm so smart I can't stand myself, just like you can't stand myself. Let's move the fleet from San Diego to Pearl Harbor on the grounds of that this will deter the Japanese from moving at all. And therefore, we won't have a war because we'll put them in a box. Well, as isn't long that, as they, that, I mean, tell you, yeah. isn't that great? In fact, as long as we do that, why don't we put some long-range bombers into the Philippines that can reach all the way to Japan? Oh, you mean those B-17s? Of course, they yeah. can't reach Japan. Well, that's true. Okay. They can well, reach into China. Well, they can, can reach Formosa. They but cut off all the... this will do... Oh, you guys. You guys are as smart as I am. Which says something to you. <laughs> or not. In other words, we won't have to use this stuff. We'll just make sure that they'll be so intimidated that they won't be a threat to American or British vital interests in the Philippines, Singapore, or what's then called the Dutch New Netherlands, which will become Indonesia after the war. Okay, we've agreed? And they won't move? No, absolutely not. Japanese won't. They'll be intimidated and they won't do anything. Okay, so then we only really have to worry about this war in Europe. That's a great idea. How do you, how do you uh, justify that in light of the fact that for the previous 30 years, uh, Plan Orange had been our primary strategic focus? What's, the, what's this Plan Orange? I haven't heard of anything yet. Well, would you explain what this Plan, plan Orange, Orange is? Plan Orange was uh, one of the color plans that uh, had been initiated back uh, under uh, the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. As a uh, law? As a, not, as a, not Franklin. No, I said Theodore. Oh, okay. As a contingent uh, for the defense of our interest in the uh, Far East. Which is particularly... The, particularly which is, the Philippines. Is, so it's a hostage rescue plan if the Japanese take the Philippines. And this, uh, this plan had been uh, worked on for more than 30 years. It had been uh, revised and, and war-gamed and studied. And uh, everybody considered this to be the most likely scenario until the late 1930s. Well, likely scenario. War, uh, in which the United States might become involved. But well, actually, the most, pre the most likely war we're going to have by most Americans is against Mexico. But if we go to war against the, in the Pacific and, and the Philippines seem to be some sort of hostage, it's virtually it is adjacent to Japanese home waters. They can take it. We have to have a plan to take it back. But, by the way, if we put these B-17s in the Philippines, in Luzon, Clark Air Force Base, and we move the fleet into Pearl Harbor, I guarantee you the Japanese will be too intimidated so we don't have to rescue the Philippines. They'll simply quake in their boots. Of course, if I'm wrong, 
we got some B-17s that will be shot, will to be destroyed, not even getting off the ground. And we're going to have some battleships like the Arizona. Lots of good men are going to be well, dead. The next thing to look at it to make that work is you have to have your you have to be able to protect what you extend out there to intimidate the Japanese. And what, MacArthur, he predicts that he'll be ready to defend Luzon effectively against the Japanese by the summer of 1942. But before then, the Filipino army won't be ready. So does this mean the Japanese look upon, obviously, a deterrent to us may look like a threat to them? And they have a window of opportunity to close this threat. Because if they wait, the Philippines will be stronger to defend. The other thing is that in 1940, America passes its first great naval building budget, the third Carl Vinson bill since, I don't know, since before since the days of Theodore Roosevelt, right. so this, the fleet, stronger. Well, this fleet will come in with 12 new aircraft carriers, not these jeep carriers, you know, the, the big enchiladas. I think 17 new battleships in, um, in 1943, meaning if Japan is going to move, they've got two to three years to move. And what looks like a deterrent which is to, to stop them from moving becomes a target to be hit. And in 19, December 1941 through the first years of the war, say through March or April 1942, what does Japan specifically or just in big pictures do? They try and extend the control of the Pacific as far as I can get it to create a large buffer so that as they go into war with the United States, uh, if they can create that buffer, they can make it more difficult for the United States to reach all the way to Japan. So and then the, they can take more control of the situation. They have time to do that. The Japanese Empire, as of December 1941, it is Formosa. They have camera. They've just established control of Cameron Bay, projecting out into the... And I always confused east and west in this world. East, into the Pacific, the Japanese Empire is how extensive in December 1941? Well, it's not very far at that point because there are several obstacles that uh, sit athwart their uh, uh, locks, one of which is the Philippines. And so before they can uh, extend their uh, area of influence in the area in which they can uh, exploit the, the resources of the Pacific, they have to take out the Philippines. But Critical for them. But, but, they, but the Philippines is not sky blue. It is an obstacle yes. on the way yes. for what is, so I'm to know we're talking about a five or six month, four or five month period in which in terms of the physical distance, the Japanese have the greatest conquest between December and April. December in the history April of 42. mankind, five month period, they are extending all the way to places nobody and very few people have ever heard of in the West. Some god awful place, Guadalcanal, or to the eastern tip of New Guinea, a place called Buna, in which does what to the U.S. strategy, which going into Pearl Harbor is to hold defensive perimeter from Alaska to Hawaii to the Panama Canal, beat Germany, and if Japan remains which I say stubborn and doesn't listen to reason after Germany is beaten, then the U.S. goes on the offensive. The only problem with a strategy, like most problems with strategy, is the opponent doesn't read the script. He doesn't know that he is supposed to, in effect, be satisfied on the other side, on his side of the wire, defensive perimeter, and Japan is now threatening to close off America's contacts with, specifically? With Australia. 
as Australia is going to be for the United States, something like Britain will be for the, for the European theater. It is the major base from which America will project its combat power yeah. and the strategy, which means that now the United States by 1942 will be making commitments by, I guess it's mid-1942, commitments which it never foresaw in the original concept of the of strategy in the Pacific. And conversely, the Japanese have expanded far beyond their initial expectations. Because I guess they were putting the pedal to the metal and say, I'll go as far as my logistics tail can take me, and there's not much physical. The resistance out there is natural. It is nature, it is the water, it is your own ability to simply get there. And they're extending far beyond their initial concept because as you said, Jeff, what? They have this idea that the further and further we extend, the more and more difficult it will be for the U.S. to push us back to our inner core empire, which we must maintain under all under all circumstances. In other words, I get in strategic depth, and that's always a good idea. Well, not really. I think the Japanese will find that out. Uh, one of the problems they have in trying to establish that buffer is, you know, it's the other side of that. The second. Uh, learning objective we have, even though we're going to look at the U.S. as far as the body command, but for the Japanese, the Pacific is a Navy theater at which once the Navy seizes the outer perimeter for the Empire, it's going to be defended by the Army. But the Army's main effort is in China. And they're, while they're prepared to... It will always be in China. It will always be in China. While they're prepared to defend what's agreed upon in the Pacific, when the Navy extends control past those agreed areas, it will cause the army forces not to be increased in the area, so they will become less strong and further out and won't be preparing defenses where they had originally agreed on on the outer perimeter. But they will be, because they will be in areas in which they are new to that area. Yes. New Guinea, the Solomons, they don't have time to prepare, and uh, certainly the combat environment right. is horrendous for everybody. They spend so much time pushing out that they continue to push until the United States is ready to do something about it, and so they have less time to prepare. Whereas if they would have had had a less strategic depth, they would have had more time to prepare what they had seized instead of less time to defend even more. Well, in this case, as horrendous as these two America ground forces, first two battles, Guadalcanal for the Marine Corps with an Army division, Buna with MacArthur, uh, and most of the most of the casualties Americans are one of disease, uh, exacerbated by malnutrition. As bad as it is for us, it's even worse for the Japanese because they are extended really beyond their reach. The Navy can relatively isolate this area. If the Japanese were well fed and sustained, I think they'd be holding Buna today. Most of their casualties are malaria and disease. And we have a hell of a time getting combat power there. Uh, and it'd be, it is relatively weak, but they are a shell when we get into contact with them. Somebody says it reminds um, historians, like Burma in the rainy season, you in effect have got these two, I don't know, a lion and a tiger, but they're chained down. Yes. And they only get, get the extent of a little paw out there because their problem is even getting out there at all. Um, what you only have a company down a trail that's all you can come in. You may have a whole division attacking, but only a company can come in contact at a time. This is, which is MacArthur's problem at Buna. The thing that saves him is that the Japanese are such, are so badly, are so strapped of basic food and medicine that they are almost withering on the vine out there to begin with. All right, so we've got this in 41-42. 
Uh, well, and beginning in, in mid-42, the United States does make greater commitments than it had ever conceived, but originally now, commitment is justified as protecting the lines of communication to Japan, to Australia. In other words, I'm still considering this within the strategic defense that I will have in the Pacific until we beat Germany. But like many things in war, you get a ladder up. Now you have beaten the Japanese at Buna. You have beaten the Japanese at Guadalcanal and then at Bougainville, which is also in this area here of lines of communication to Australia. Now the question is, what do we do next? Well, you got two choices. One is, once you've solidified and and held that line of communication. Well, isn't that Australia. what? I, was that my, was that my purpose? Yes, I says your one choice is at that point in time fall back on the defensive and shift your reforce, resources back to Europe. Uh, Sounds your other good choice, to me. Your other choice is to change your mind and and say, look, right now we've got them backing backpedaling. We've got to keep them. We got to keep pushing to keep because them from if we getting don't, set. Because we got them they're going to consolidate. They consolidate. They dig in. They fortify. And boy, that's going to be a tough nut to crack when you go after them in 1945 or 46. Or 47. Or 47. But there's also another condition that makes that possible. And that is that mobilization is being more successful than anticipated. More equipment is coming off the production line than you had anticipated. So now you have more resources to do more with. Now there's another issue on this because this is a theater of a global war. Yes. And that is the United States is still not putting ground forces you have any great strength into Europe because we still have a Mediterranean strategy and how many divisions can you put into Sicily? Yeah. Meaning that now because in effect the cross-channel invasion is now being put on hold while America and the British are debating this whole strategy and this issue and the other thing is that the Russians have survived 41. They have survived at Stalingrad for the winter of 42, 43. They are holding their own. It would mean with all these issues, I think we're gonna change the nature of this European first strategy. So you're saying Germany all of a sudden becomes less of a threat? No, well, not less of a threat. I think Germany remains a great threat. But, but it, but it, less than they were before. But we it, thought it Germany doesn't. Germany threatening yes, we're not talking existence. about Germany beating the Russians after Stalingrad. We may be talking about the Russians exhausting, and the Germans and the Russians, which is a big fear in the United States, about coming to some sort of understanding. Maybe going back to the borders of 1939 or 41. It's a possibility, but we're not considering as we did in December 41. Are the Russians about to be closed off within a three to four month period? Germany may remain still the major threat, but it looks like the Russians can hold their end of the bargain. We have yet to find to get into Northwest Europe a lodgement area in which we can commit these masses of forces. And here is all these issues to say we're going to change the nature of Europe first, or Germany first. And it changes with the U.S. where it once was holding the Pacific, winning Europe, and then go on the offensive in the Pacific, there'd probably be a two year, some people say three year, difference between VE Day and VJ Day. The idea is to go on a two ocean war and V and the difference in Europe first is, we'll just have a surrender of Germany first and our people, particularly Marshall's very good at this one, is that we're going to be in trouble politically at home once we defeat Germany. There'll be a lot of people saying it's Miller time. As they do is that we better have a closed window. We better make this a bang bang finish. You know.
know, three to six months maximum, or else what's going to happen is, remember, is, uh, we've got some disadvantages or advantages is that uh, we, certainly the Russians and the Germans don't have. Uh, we don't put, they don't put war strategy, grand strategy up to a political vote. In fact, neither do the British. They will not hold an election during a war. They say, we're going to depoliticize this. The United States is the only country that I know of in the world that has elections in the midst of the war. And if the public say, hey, you guys are screwing up, we can, um, if we can't, we can find a new commander in chief. Um, anyway, so in 43, we changed the nature of this European first strategy. And we say, um, go on the offensive in the Pacific. But that doesn't tell me much. Uh, go on the offensive with who as Sink Pacific and in what avenue of approach towards um, the Far East. Uh, we have got the Navy out of Pearl Harbor uh, owning the Central Pacific. We have Douglas MacArthur, commander of Southwest Pacific Area out of his base in Australia into New Guinea trying to go towards, excuse me, the Philippines. I guess the Navy's on its way, it hopes, towards Formosa. And, um, well, any good arguments for making Douglas MacArthur sink Pacific Theater? which would make Southwest Pacific Area the main avenue of approach and having in effect the Navy being the transport service for the, for the Army and of course protecting the Army transportation from uh, raids by uh, aircraft carriers essentially. Uh, as you already uh, stated earlier, the Pacific is essentially a Navy theater. So, so that's it's, to be said against? It's a, uh, a, it's a large body of water. Uh, you're not going to do anything out there without the Navy. The, well, Navy, they, the you, Navy will not only transport you to and from where you're going, it will protect your, your vessels as they go to and from. Uh, it will also ultimately, at some point in the future, be responsible for carrying the war to the enemy. Well, here, well, obviously, this no. world, I mean, it was sort of my, it isn't my fault that this, no, water, that this world is two-thirds water. I mean, if it was at least me, it would be decaffeinated coffee. But the question is, is that the function of the Navy to do what essentially the Navy no. does for the European theater, which is to get the Army ashore and get it supplied? Now, if the Navy loses the Battle of the Atlantic, we cannot get an army ashore. But look, we got a, a, a Europe, he's not a European theater, it's not Europe-wide, a uh, Schaaf commander, who's an army guy, Eisenhower, under the understanding that the army will be the lead service for beating Germany. But you have to deal with Douglas MacArthur, who... Do I have to? Who is, yes, you can't, you can't uh, avoid dealing with Douglas MacArthur. No, you can't all, talk about this war and not talk about Douglas MacArthur. By great, he's, he outranks the chief of staff. He doesn't out, yeah, but he doesn't out, by great, outrank the president of the United States. No. But the thing is, in, in 1940, Douglas MacArthur is perhaps the only soldier whose name is known in every household in America. At that time, uh, people like Dwight Eisenhower are still uh, obscure colonels. Lieutenant uh, colonels. And, uh, and people like uh, George Marshall uh, are still not uh, totally known quantities. But Douglas MacArthur is a force. Oh, uh, well, I understand. Okay. And, and you, have to, you have to deal with this guy. Uh, he has uh, a name recognition. He is a genuine American hero. He has been a general officer now for uh, 22 years, uh, longer than, than well, many here, of the soldiers got, will be alive. Well, here, so far what you have given me, and I'm President of the United States, is political advice about that this guy can raise a crowd against me, he may be even a challenger if he resigns. 
what Harry Truman used to say when military guys gave him political advice saying that's, a, that's my business not yours. And Harry Truman at this time was an obscure senator from Missouri. Thank you. I'll make the point again. Which is... <laughs> In 1950 Harry, you can say that. <laughs> thank you. Is that I don't want political advice from amateurs. I'll go to politicians for political advice. I'm asking you to give me a good military reason why I should not make the Central Pacific the main avenue of approach. What is to be said for SWAPA? Well, once again, if you would uh, let me... Uh do I have to? Proceed. You can't, you can't separate these issues from issues of personality and from issues of history. In other, uh, in other words, you want Franklin to give Ro me these political reasons. Franklin Roosevelt, but, but you can't separate them. I you certainly can't. You can. can't separate the military from the political. Oh. There's every reason to argue that the Central Pacific is the shortest route to Tokyo. There's every reason to argue that, that Plan Orange, which had been worked on for by the three, Navy for three the decades, Army. for three decades, in fact, uh, came up with the the best possible solution to defeat a Japanese threat in the Pacific. Well, what would be? I wish we had maps here. What would be the downside of using this extraordinary fleet, particularly these fast aircraft carriers, as? for your support for Douglas MacArthur's hopping up the spine of New Guinea back to the Philippines, which I guess we could argue as, as a pace, particularly when we could then reconstitute it as a submarine base to cut off Japanese supplies to the Southwest Pacific area, which is particularly its energy and petroleum as supplies. As it turns out, you don't need the Philippines as a submarine base. Pearl Harbor works very fine. All the more reason base. now than, than for, than to argue that, that, that General MacArthur should be made some backwater commander, except for the fact that he's got name recognition. There, there's another reason, and, and once again, you will perhaps disagree with it because it is a political moral obligation, and that is when MacArthur goes on uh, uh, the national media in March of 1942 with his famous uh, I shall return speech. This is a commitment which the United States is going to find it very difficult to uh, turn its uh, uh, a blind eye to. Uh, first of all, we have a moral political commitment to the Philippines. Yes, but you know how you can get the Philippines? You force the Japanese to surrender in Tokyo. And guess what? They don't keep, they don't keep the Philippines. I, I don't disagree with that. What, what I'm saying is that it's not clear in perhaps March and April of 1942, when these deals are being worked out, what's going to happen by uh, 1944, when we have clearly taken the initiative, when our subsequent <coughs> campaign is being very effectively unleashed against the uh, Japanese uh, trade in the Western Pacific, when, when we have landed now uh, in the Philippines, uh, when we have also landed uh, on numerous other islands in the Pacific, and we have begun to figure out how to fight our way back across the Pacific. Nobody can predict in the early months of 1942 how successful the fast carrier task force is going to be. That is all yet in the future. There are people who make claims, who prophesy, who foresee, but nobody can tell you yet how successful that is going to be. And there are those Americans who have that great sentimental feeling uh, for, the, for the Filipinos who have been painted in American propaganda as suffering grievously under the occupation well, of the, the if Japanese. They, if they do resist, collaborators don't suffer. But people who resist do. And, and I'm not saying they don't. I'm just saying there's a tremendous propaganda effort. So far, in the United so far, so far, I haven't given I've, you a single military well reason. thing that and thing that will that will not pass such things as you've given me lots of 
political reasons. Well, presidents are get to office by but being political high people. High level strategic decisions are often made for political reasons. Well, with the, but political means a lot of different things. You're talking essentially domestic political, okay, as okay. opposed to this, international this political. This is a domestic. Thank, issue. thank you. When and I run, when I run for county commissioner, I know who to make my campaign 19, chairman, Jeff. And there's something something <laughs> is going to happen in November of 1942. There's going to be a congressional election, which will perhaps be a mandate on the conduct of the war up to that point. And 1942 has not been a happy year no, for the United States fortunes around the world. And no question about so it. It's one of the things that reason why when Franklin Roosevelt gets into Guadalcanal, which is the longest battle in American history. I'm not even sure we should call it a battle. It's a campaign that lasts for approximately six months from August of uh, of um, the 42 to, to January is that he is sure as hell doesn't want a loss to stare him in this face. But now that we have got Guadalcanal, the question and and we made the decision for I think justifiable military reasons that the world has changed since December that we can go on a two ocean offense or a two continent offense at the same time, the question becomes for the Pacific, what should be the avenue of approach? Now, MacArthur obviously wants to make it his area of operations. Oh, yes, before, Nimitz for... wants to make it his area of operations. What would be the downside since you apparently don't think there is much I say before you get to the downside, you asked for the military reasons why you should focus on MacArthur going up the Philippines. Yes. The first one is to interdict the Japanese line of communication into the southern resources area. Okay. If you focus on the Central Pacific first, trying to get to the main islands in Japan, you are not going to be able to invade the main islands in Japan until you can weaken their military machine, and you can't do that unless you interdict their access into the southern Jerry's resources area. Because actually done through the submarine campaign, not by taking the Philippines. Again, that's not predicted that, that can be that's effective. And, if you take and there's a look another at the thing German on this. They, they would be more effective if we could liberate the Philippines. Even I can understand that when you were projecting yes. all the way from Pearl Harbor, your turnaround time and your petroleum expenditure just to get in this area, you obviously would like a base. Now, it so happens that the submarines are effective prior to the liberation of Luzon, which I guess isn't really until December of 44. But that's not predicted. It. Okay. And yeah. Largely, if, as a if result you of could Japanese retake ability. the Philippines in early, early 1943 or mid 1943, and effectively interdict those locks from the Dutch East Indies, then that would be a strong military argument for, for the swap. Mm. The problem is, however, that in the early months of 1943, you're still mopping up in New Guinea. You're not. You're a long way from That's being true. ready to go to the Philippines yet, and That's you true. have other places that uh, still have to be. Which dealt is kind of interesting because when you look at the decisions that are being made, they're based on timetables that are years out, and not in a matter of months. They're trying to say we think in six months this is going to be the situation, and they make decisions based on that prediction. And it's kind of interesting when you watch that go on. A second military reason: uh, if you're able to retake the Philippines, you remove any threats to Australia that still exist. Uh, from the Japanese. Not, now that's not a major reason because from the Philippines they can only reach I think with air power into the northwestern part yeah. of Australia. And there's nothing there. So except you could argue, Darwin, which is probably over, yeah. overblown as a So as you a could still argue asset. that that may be primarily a political reason as opposed to a military reason. And then you also have the possibility of being able to bring in Filipinos into the American Armed Forces, but I don't think that's a major reason either. A third and probably more important in the decision that that could have been important a decision to focus on the Philippines is to open up a line of communication into China that doesn't go through <coughs> Burma that allows you to base aircraft in China so you can bomb Japan directly from All China. All the more reason now for going to Formosa 
Not yes, to the and, which means Formosa. So you go through the Philippines would be to the, reach Formosa. Well, or else a, a direct move from the Central Pacific to Formosa. Now, the problem there, and it kind of gets a problem, you, you can do that from the Central Pacific, but then this, the flank of the Central Pacific approach is threatened from the Philippines. So to if you go through the Central Pacific to Formosa, you need to, again, seize the Philippines to protect that left flank. But the Japanese strength in the Philippines ultimately is is not its naval and sea power, but approximately 300,000 men that they will eventually move into the Philippines. Yes. As, as we see in such battles as uh, the Leyte Gulf, uh, Japanese naval power. Uh, of course, that's be, late in 44. Uh, no, it's, that, it's land, air, power, that, and then you're in, trying to predict case. well out. But that doesn't mean that you can't have the main effort still be in the Central Pacific, controlled by Nimitz, with MacArthur and the Philippines being a supporting effort. Okay, since both you guys failed this question, and these pe poor people here are listening saying, you mean these guys can't even agree on what day it is? And I'm going to have to listen to these guys for help? I will summarize, and then hopefully get on to another issue. Uh, there's good arguments for both sides. Um, if we had a map here, you could see that particularly these, these aircraft carriers, and particularly the way they're built by the American Navy. They are built to have maximum amount of uh, planes, natural amount of, uh, of, um, of munitions, which means, as I've said before in a prior one, they're made with teak wood decks rather than they are today with steel decks. This is an extraordinary amount of combat power in, I guess, an area as large as two football fields. Nothing equivalent to it in ground warfare, but it, it is very vulnerable. And in Swapa area, it is literally running a gauntlet. It would be far, far preferable to use the Central Pacific, which is masses amount of water with little I'm looking for the words. Uh, they're not even islands. What do we call them? The atolls. Little atolls here in which an aircraft carrier, well, the job is to hide or disguise its position. If it can be in any point in the circumference, obviously it's safer. If you go against a place like New Guinea, by its very width, you're cutting it, it can only be in half the circumference, I'm immediately cutting off 180 degrees of searching for it. So it is hell for aircraft carriers. But on the other hand, what MacArthur does have, there's no room for maneuver in aircraft carriers or capital ships or cruisers. However, what does MacArthur have as a, has as a military argument for SWAPA? And that is, where once infantry gets ashore at places like Tarawa, where can it maneuver? Straight ahead. It can't. It's a postage stamp. Swapa is maneuver space for infantry. MacArthur, and he becomes an expert at this, can in effect land behind enemy lines. There is no landing behind enemy lines on these postage stamps, Kwajalein or Tarawa in the Central Pacific. In other words, that is area may be safe for the Navy, but it's hell on the Navy's Army, the Marine Corps. Yeah, but, you know, there is a prima ballerina, and in the Navy, it is the aircraft carrier, and it is infantry that's sacrificed to the prima ballerina. And in SWAPA, infantry in Supreme, this is an army base, and the Navy will be exposed. So there are good arguments to be said for, or bad arguments to be said for either avenue of approach. And the final American solution when there are good arguments or bad arguments on either side is, okay, same arguments for A, same arguments for B, and my final decision will be A or B is what? A and B. A and B. Do them both. Don't have a commander-in-chief Pacific area. What's to be said for that type of final decision? Well, one, everybody gets a piece of the action. 
Again, we're back to politics. Yes. Military. What's to be said for it for military, military justification? It presents some significant problems for the Japanese because there is no main effort for them to put their main effort against for defense. And with their inability of with their inability to maneuver across the Pacific once the US Navy takes control of it, it causes them to split <laughs> their efforts on both avenues where the United States and and in spite of their adversarial relationship, Nimitz and MacArthur actually cooperate. They're able to shift the main effort back and forth between the two axes so that they're able to, to bring overwhelming combat power to bear on either axis on an alternating basis. And they're able to do that because the increasing resources available to those forces allow Are them increasing. that freedom. Oh. If you have a resource constrained situation, then you have to make a decision <coughs> yes. which one of those two forces will get the resources. But as resources expand, and they expand very well in 43, and more so in 44, you have now the freedom of action to choose one or the other or both. So and the correct decision in retrospect was to? To do exactly what they did, have dual main axes. But So this turns out to be a correct military decision perhaps done for incorrect reasons. In other words, Roosevelt doesn't want to have a revolt in the army or a revolt of the navy. He can't make up his mind, so he does what any politician will do in this situation. He will not make a clear decision. He will give approximately the same thing to each of these two petitioning groups which may be a hell of a way to run a railroad, but it turns out to be the correct decision. It works. It gets the cargo there because you have enough engines. Well, I know it works, but, but probably you have enough engines. <laughs> the question is not just whether it works, because I think Squapa, if would have eventually worked, the Central Pacific worked. My question is: Is this the correct decision, the best decision that could have been made? And maybe it was made because we should have had somebody in the White House who would make a decision, but he didn't. He let, in effect, the situation dictate to him, and it turns out to be what was the, the best situation? Yes. You have an opinion on this, or is this the one topic of the world you don't well, have an I'm, opinion on? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> prepared to say that uh, if you judge it ex post facto, it's the right decision. Well, that's what we do in our business. We it, judge everything ex post facto. It's, it's interesting you know, as you look at it, we're talking about unity of effort between the commands as opposed to the principle of <coughs> unity of command. Unity of effort is what is done by joint or combined operations by, in effect, separate institutions yes. because one will not subordinate to another. Wait, I have a protest against this position that this turns out to be the correct decision for military reasons. I would say in retrospect. The correct decision. Well, you said the correct decision. We'll settle on, this Mike. one away from the camera. <laughs> get, get on, we got, you got to win the war yet. <laughs> well, we may never get to it. What, is, what turns out to be the downside, I believe that Central Pacific, this is, we've got these aircraft carriers that once they get sunk, takes three years to build, they cannot be replaced. They have to be used in the Central Pacific. The real, if we look upon this strictly as a Pacific theater issue, this dual approach turns out to be not a correct decision. You're wrong, as you usually are. It turns out to be the correct decision. One problem is that this is not a Pacific War. This is a Pacific theater in a world war. MacArthur has got, I guess it's two armies, right? Um, yes. He's got sixth under his, the 6th and the 8th. This could have been Eisenhower's strategic reserve. It would have given Eisenhower another army group for Europe in 1944. Those poor guys uh, from September to March 
September 1944 to March 1945 are on the line day in and day out because there is no reserve. Eisenhower's strategic reserve so that he could do the type of punch a hole and exploit that the Russians do which have a great operational reserves are with Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea and that's the downside of a good decision but there are no decisions that don't have downsides. Okay, I'm trying to give a brief se separate wrap-up now so I can get you out from watching this tape and back to your real work. This is on how the war in J the United States against Japan ends. For those who want a fuller uh, rendition of at least my thesis, I uh, I can't say I recommend, but you may want to read Unconditional Surrender to Mobilization of the Atomic Bomb. It's an essay I wrote. It's published at CSI. It's for free, so at least you'll get your money's worth. All right, what's the situation in 1945? Uh, Japan has never conceived of the possibility of the conquest and the occupation of the United States. They have always wanted by uh, the force of arms to impose the, their empire in uh, the Pacific to make the United States accept it as a fact of life, like say the United States had, had accepted the British Empire as a fact of life. Um, and they planned to do this in 1945 by raising up the cost in blood and treasure of continuing this war. Now in 1941-42, Japan had extended their empire from its core Northern Asian Empire, which is Formosa, uh, Korea, Manchuria, and Northern China into what we talked about earlier, which is everything from French Indochina all the way east to the Solomons uh, in tropical or Southern Asia. Now they've all lost all that by 1945, but they haven't lost their core Northern Asia empire. And in 1945, at uh, Luzon, Okinawa, and Iwo Jima, the United States suffers 50% of the total casualties in six months time that it will, it will suffer in, three in, in, in the total war three and a half years. At this time, there are lots of signals that Japan's strategy is working in that war weariness is setting in on the American public. And it becomes particularly acute after VE Day, victory in Europe, because the United States obviously wants to celebrate. What's the indication of this war weariness? Well, demobilization of the U.S. Army. 450,000 soldiers, combat veterans. Uh, George Marshall calls them the wheels that make the army run are demobilized early. Congress is talking about demobilizing another million men and we have yet to face what is the worst problem maybe in this entire war which is the invasion of the home islands of Japan. Japan plans, they know exactly what beaches we're trying to, we're planning to invade. They virtually call the time, our order of battle, meet that force on the beachhead, knock it back and then negotiate negotiate, assist a, a peace treaty in which they will retain control of obviously Japan itself. There will be no demilitarization, no war criminals. The Japanese army will retain control of the Japanese government and their northern Asian empire. Well, what's the U.S. response to that? We demand unconditional surrender. At the same time, we demand demobilization of our own army. So there's an enormous gap between Japanese demands, U.S. demands, and also a growing gap between U.S. demands and the price and blood and treasure that the U.S. will pay for it. How do you close that gap? Well, in war, you do it with armed conflict. But I think we've about had it in the blood that we are willing to spill of our own blood. And the way how you close that gap in 1945 
you guessed it, is the atomic bomb. This way America can have its war aims and demilitarize and change the political structure of Japan without paying the price on the beachheads that Japan would have extracted from us. Okay, gang, hope you enjoyed it.